first hour, I want to finish up with what we have to cover. And the second hour, we'll review the term and answer questions and what, all the rest of it. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay, having covered the, the labor market, supply of, la of labor, population, unions, etc., and the price and wage rates, we next we now have to wrap up two things. Well, interest rates and, and along with it, the uh, difference between unit prices and the price of the whole product. When we've, been, when we've talked about wage rates, we've been talking about, or prices of factors of production. Um, <clears throat> we've been talking about how, it's deter how the demand is determined by the marginal revenue product, which is the marginal physical product times the marginal revenue. Okay, so, so what we want to do now is to focus on the time, the time uh, uh, dimension. In other words, Revenue, physical product means how much product is produced by one extra worker or whatever, one, one more acre of land, in a certain time period. This, of course, means in a certain, that's been the implicitly, implicit all along. That's how much product is produced in a given time period. So the wage rate, or the price of the land, or the price of capital goods, will be that price given a certain, uh, a certain time period. <clears throat> um, so this means that the price per time period in other words, for workers, for, for labor, it's wages either per hour or per month or per year, okay. uh, because it's product per month or per year we're dealing with. <clears throat> so in other words, when we've been talking about prices, especially prices of factors of production, uh, labor, land, and capital, we talk about the price per unit time. So it's the price per unit time. Uh, because it's also production per unit time. Production takes place over a certain time period. So when you, when you talk about a product, uh, you know, you add one laborer to a certain amount of capital goods and land, and it, and it produces 20 more bushels of wheat. It's 20 more bushels of wheat in what time period? Well, whatever the time period is, a month or a year or whatever. So therefore, we're now, we're now going to focus on the time period involved here. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so price per unit time means exactly that. Wages per hour. Uh, and for physical products, it means rent. In other words, the rent per the rent is, is a price per unit time. So, for example, what we've really been talking about up till now is that uh, workers are hired; they're paid per unit time. Or when you when you when you uh, buy when an entrepreneur buys capital equipment, let's say, or, or land, you can either buy it or rent it. In other words, if you're a business man, you, you, you can either rent your building or rent your land, or actually or rent machines or plants. There's a lot of renting going on. And business largely for, for tax purposes, get out of income tax. But there's a lot of rent, so you can either buy something or rent it. These are the choices which you have in any, any, any business. <clears throat> so what we've been talking about up till now, we talk about price of factors of production, we've really been talking about the price per unit time, wages per hour, and rent. In other words, price per unit, uh, let's say, rental price per, per, per month or per year. <clears throat> So when you rent a house as a consumer or a businessman, you're renting it for a year or land, for a year or for, or for, a, or for a month or whatever. You're renting it for a time period. So the rental price of anything is the price per unit time. <clears throat> so in a sense, what we're dealing with, uh, what we've been talking about is the price determination, uh, marginal productivity, price determination for rental prices, the price per month or per year of land or capital goods or labor. Because what a wage really is, is really a rent of, of labor. In other words, you, since you can't buy a laborer, except under slavery, in, free, in a free system you can only rent a person. You can't buy, a, buy him, buy his whole product, so to speak. So you rent him per, from the laborer himself. You rent his services per unit time. <clears throat> so a wage is also a rent. In other words, I'm dealing with rent now, not, as a, uh, not, as a partic not just for land, a rent is for anything. When you rent something out, it means a price per unit time. When you rent a TV, you can either buy a TV set or rent it. You can either, either buy a car or rent it or lease it. It's all the same thing. In other words, when you, when you rent a car for a year or for a day or whatever it is, you're using its services per unit, per unit time. When you buy the thing as a outright, when you buy the house or buy the car, you, you, you're, buying all of, you're buying all the future services that the thing can give you. So you're buying the whole product or the whole thing. Whereas, when you buy it per, per hour, per month, or whatever, you're, you're renting it. So we're using the term rent not the way the textbooks use it usually. We're using it as a, as a common sense phrase, as a price per unit time of anything, of any, of any product that can give you a service. 
that you're buying the services per unit. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so you can either rent a TV set or buy it. Uh, you can either rent, you can even rent tuxedos and things like that. So uh, your, the consumer or the producer is always faced with a choice of rental, in other words, buying the unit service or buying the whole thing and enjoying all the unit services, uh, all future unit services. So rent is a really generalized concept to mean the price of any the price of any unit service. So what we're saying here is that the in the, in the for prices of factors of production, the rental price of anything, the rental price is equal to the marginal revenue product, or the demand for the uh, or the demand for the labor service will be equal to the, uh, will, will yield the rent to be equal to the marginal revenue product. So the rental the rental price is the way we're looking at it. Um, now, under slavery, one of the interesting things about slavery is that it, it, it illustrates this general concept for, for labor as well as for anything else. Under slavery, slaves are often rented as well as bought. In other words, somebody wants to say you're, you're, run, you're operating a plant or, or, or plantation, whatever, seasonally, the, the master would often, instead of buying a slave, would rent the slaves out from other masters. Now, in that case, <coughs> the... Um, in other words, you can either buy a slave or rent them. So the, again, you have a situation where there's some kind of relationship between the rent and the purchase price. The rent, the, the slave rent. Uh, in other words, under slavery, you have a you have demand for labor. The demand curve is the marginal revenue product. This is the wage rate. Uh, on a free in a free system, in a free labor system, the uh, the, uh, the, the market wage will be equal to the marginal revenue product and the intersection of the marginal revenue product of the, of the demand curve and the supply curve. Under slavery, it's still the same thing. Every slave has a marginal revenue product, usually lower than under a free system because there's not much incentive to work or to be, you know, to be creative or anything like that. But under a slave system, the slave master appropriates, the slave master gets, say the slave master rents out the slave. The rent is equal to the marginal revenue product. It's up here. <clears throat> but the, the slave master will only pay the slave the amount rent enough to keep the slave functioning, you know, keep him eating and reproducing. And the master gets the appropriates or expropriates the difference, the surplus value, so to speak, goes to the, to the slave master. <clears throat> so this is a subsistence level. Uh, the, Marxian, and the Marxist analysis of the wages are, are determined by the subsistence level, and, uh, and a capitalist expropriate everything up to marginal revenue product, basically, only holds true for slavery, where the, indeed the master can expropriate, the master has the guns to do it. So uh, the, 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 the price, the rental price of the slave, or the wage rate of the slave, whichever you want to call it, is still determined by the marginal revenue product. <clears throat> um, so then the question is, so, so we now have determined all the rental prices for everything, in other words, for, for land, labor, and capital. Then the question is, what determines the, the price of the whole thing if you buy it, either a slave under slavery or capital goods or equipment or land or whatever you're, whatever you're purchasing? Is there any relationship between the rental price and the price of the whole thing, so to speak? That's the, the next step, too. So, in other words, what we've, been, what we've been talking about all this time is really the rental price, the price per unit, the wage rate, the, rental, the, the land rent, and the capital price per the land, the rental price of the capital equipment. So now what we have to determine is what, what is the relationship between the price of the whole thing and the rental price of anything, whether it's a TV set or a house or a labor under slavery or a capital good or land or anything else. All these factors of production uh, can be purchased as a whole. Uh, okay, so let's look at this. The, what I call the price of the whole, the whole thing, the price of the whole factor. <coughs> Um, when you buy something, when you buy a ca capital equipment, or you buy a land, or you buy a TV set or whatever, what you're doing is, or you buy a house, you're, you're, bu you're, you're buying the right to appropriate all the future services, the future unit product, or the future rental product, so to speak, of the item. So if a, um, if for example, a machine will has a 10-year life, let's say, and, uh, <coughs> If the uh, revenue product of the machine is, is say, $10,000 a year, in other words, you use it, you get a marginal revenue product of $10,000 a year, you can rent it out, you'll pay $10,000 a year for it. Or if you buy it and you rent it out, somebody else, he will pay you $10,000 a year for it. So we're just assuming now the rental price of this machine, okay, of the machine, which, e which is equal to the marginal revenue product, will be $10,000 per year. 
So let's say the machine, let's assume for a minute the machine, you know, dies out of 10 years. I mean, usually these things are much more variable than that. Let's assume you use it for 10 years and it collapses like a one horse shea. All right, so that means if you buy it, if you buy this machine and then rent it out, or then you, if you use it in production, you, you will earn from it $10,000 per year for 10 years. Okay? 10 year life. So as a first approximation, we can say that the price of the whole thing will be the, sum, the summation, price of the machine as a whole, will be the sum of the rental price, or the sum of the marginal revenue of products over the, over the life of the machine. So it should be, you'd think it would be $100,000, because you're getting $100,000 worth of equipment. <coughs> So that's the sort of the initial first approximation. You're getting, you're getting the or the sum of the rents, some of the return. Okay. You have a rental value of ten thousand a year from this machine. You buy the machine, you got for ten years, a ten years worth, a ten years life, and you will earn either by producing it, have, using it in production, or by renting it out to somebody else who uses it in production. You'll earn ten thousand dollars a year. So you think there's going to be hundred thousand dollars? Of course, it won't. However, it could be a lot less than that, uh, because and the reason for that is the basic fact of time preference. In other words, that, which I talked about at the beginning of the class, I haven't mentioned much since, but the, the basic point is that everybody prefers income now to income in the future, to the prospect of income in the future. In other words, if you're presented with the idea of, I'll give you a million dollars now, or anything, give you a hundred dollars now, let's say, or else I'm, I'll give you a hundred dollars ten years from now, aside from price changes, it seems like this, forget about prices changing. You obviously prefer getting $100 now. Even if you want to save it, or save some of it, you want to control it yourself instead of having me control it. Everybody prefers getting money or anything else now to waiting for it, like they're getting it two years from now, 10 years from now, 100 years from now. The longer you have to wait, the less you like it. So the basic time preference, everybody prefers <coughs> present goods, in other words, getting goods now, uh, getting money now or, or products now, to future goods, which means the present prospect of getting money in the future. Notice what it, well, you're not, we're not saying that you prefer the, to get $100 now than, than getting it 10 years from now. What you're saying is we prefer $100 now to the current prospect of getting $100 10 years from now. It's a different, it's a different point. In other words, here we are in 1986. We're confronted with, two, with a choice. Either we get $100 right now, or else we don't have to wait for it for 10 years. What we're saying is we prefer right now to get the $100 now than to wait and they're getting an IOU for 100 bucks for 10 years from now. That's the point. So since, so we, in other words, what we have all over the market, the economy, we have a time market which permeates the entire system. So unfortunately, most microeconomics doesn't deal much with. It just deals with very peripherally. There's a time market. There's a market of present goods and future goods all over the place. Um, and part of the market is uh, the most obvious part of the market, of course, is the loan market. I loan you $100 or $1,000 and get a, an IOU for the future. Uh, so here we have a, have a time market. In other words, the time market is a vast market where present and future goods are being exchanged for each other. An exchange of present for future. Um, future, for example, the credit market is, an, I would say, an obvious example of this, a loan market. Uh, let's say I, I lend a thousand dollars to somebody here, and what happens now is the creditor turns over a thousand dollars, which the debtor can use right now. Okay? So that's the here's the creditor, and here's the debtor. So the debtor, what happens is that the creditor, this thousand dollars can be used right away. That's a present good. In return for that, the other person gives me an IOU saying I will pay you a certain amount next. Uh, Next May, let's say. So I get an IOU for a future good, which is, uh, you know, for, for 1987. Now, what I'm saying is, since present goods are always worth more than future goods, both for the creditor and for the debtor, everybody in the country, they have different rates of preference. Some people are, have a high time preference. Well, some of them have a high time preference. They want money right away. That they, might, they could spend, they don't care about that much about the future. They're willing to pay up a lot. Uh, in the future to get money now. Others have a much lower time preference, but everybody's got a positive time preference. Everybody prefers, to some extent, present to future goods. And the time market will then resolve this through, you know, through one price system like anything else, where 
Um, some people have high time prices, others have a low time prices, and they change it so, so interest rates are more, become more or less the same. These tend to become more or less the same. And so the, let's say it's 8%. So that means that the, an IOU for future goods, so that the, I'm exchanging $1,000 now for an IOU for 1080 So that's 8%. In other words, in that case, the price of time, so to speak, is 8%. That's the time rate uh, per annum, of course, per year. Uh, when interest rates are lower, as they were in the old days, for various reasons, if interest rates five percent, the exchanges for thousand for IOU for thousand fifty. So that's uh, <clears throat> and in the days when it was up to twenty percent for for a year or so, it was up to about twenty percent in the early in the early seventies. Then it would have been uh, twelve hundred dollars, or ten percent is eleven hundred dollars. So depending on what the interest rate is, this is more or less the tendency of what the time rate will be. And that is, the time rate is the interest rate, it's the basic interest rate. Okay? This is the, there are other factors going in, this is the basic or pure or whatever you want to call it, call it the basic interest rate. So in other words, interest is the price of time. It's the, it's the time market. It's exchanging present goods and future goods. So when you borrow from American Express or whatever it is, or buy, get a mortgage out, you're getting money now in exchange for which you're paying the, the creditor at a premium uh, for, 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 you know, you're paying back in the future. So that's the present future market. So uh, when you go to a restaurant and you buy a TV set or something and you use a credit card, what happens there is American Express or Masters, whatever it is, pays the guy right now, more or less right now, pays the restaurant, shh, pays the restaurant owner or the, or the TV owner, the store right now, in exchange for which you pay the American Express whatever it is, 20% or 10% or whatever the rate is until you pay it off uh, at an interest return of uh, annual return of say 20% or 15 Well, that, that of course also fluctuates in accordance with the basic interest rates. <clears throat> so in other words, the basic interest rate is the time rate. <clears throat> and, um, and all throughout the market, you have this kind of time market going on, one of which is the credit market, the most obvious one. But also, when a, when a businessman hires labor or buys machines, what he's doing is he's, he's getting a future return. In other words, he's saying, okay, uh, or, or rents a machine or whatever. He's saying, for, for, we'll pay you now in return for which we're going to get, the, I'm going to produce the product and so forth and so on and, and sell it a year from now or two years from now and get a certain return from it. Uh, the worker and the landlord, et cetera, et cetera, don't get the full margin of revenue product. They get the margin of revenue product actually discounted by the rate of interest. In other words, they're getting a, in order, because if you didn't have a capitalist doing this, if everybody everybody have to work on the equipment, let's say they have to work five years on something, a computer firm, whatever, IBM, and finally they sell the product, and then you get paid. So you'd have to wait two years, five years, depending on ten years, depending on what the product was, before any payment came in. Most of us can't afford to wait ten years for a paycheck. Uh, so the capitalist saves the money up, pays out the money now as a present good to workers, landlords, and whatever, machine people sell more materials, and he then waits, then works on the product, directs the working of the product, and then gets the, gets the return in the future. And in return for this waiting, in return for this time preference, he gets the, the 8% or 6% or whatever the interest charge is. So interest is a general uh, feature of production, it's part of the production system, long run interest, uh, which exists even in equilibrium when all the profits and losses are washed out, even in long final equilibrium because as a return for paying out money now and waiting for it late until the future. <clears throat> and um, uh, in other words, part of the discount of the future goes against present goods. <clears throat> um, in the case of the price of the whole thing and rental charge, what you've got is when you buy a machine and expect to get $10,000 a year for, for, for rent for 10 years, it's true you'll get it, but the price of a, of a of Ten thousand the price of a hundred thousand dollars stretched over ten years now is not a hundred thousand dollars, so you have to wait for it. It's it's ten thousand dollars discounted each year by whatever the interest rate is. So in other words, if the interest rate is ten percent, to make it simple, uh, you you're buying a machine which will get which everybody agrees about say will give you ten thousand dollars rental return or productivity per year. Uh, for the first year, let's say that well for the first year Let's say you get the money right now, for getting it for the first year, you pay $10,000, worth $10,000. The next year, it's only worth 10% of that. So you deduct $1,000, that makes it $9,000. And then you deduct another 10%, that makes it $8,100. And on into the future. So instead of 
instead of adding up to 100,000, you add up to something, whatever it is, 53,000, something like that. In other words, you add up that you're getting 10% a year interest. So um, if it's 53,000, when you buy 53,000, you, you use it for 10 years, and you get your 10% interest per year for the 10 years. So in other words, the, the capital, the price of the whole product on the market, whether it's a labor under slavery or a labor under slavery, or whether it's a capital machine or a piece of land, the price of the whole product will, will tend to be not the sum of, of future rents, which is what we first said, the sum of, of, of rents, it will be the sum of future rents discounted by the rate of interest. Okay. Uh, so it's the discounted sum, discounted or discounted future rents. We multiply I times the each each rental return. In other words, if if rental return per year is capital R, uh, instead of in other words, the first approximation would have been the sum of sum of R, ten thousand dollars a year for ten years. Now we're saying if each R is discounted by the rate of interest, you multiply by the rate of interest to get the actual amount. Um, we call the we call the price of the whole product as a that's an awkward term, obviously. So the term that's generally used is capital value. Uh, so that, in other words, if you buy a house or if you buy a machine and you or land and rent it out, the price of the whole thing to buy it is called the capital value of that of that good. The capital value is the, is the sum of future rents. This kind of rate of interest. There are divided by I. <coughs> um, so. Uh, <coughs> So the formula, the famous formula, C equals capital R over I. This is this only works this way. It's only this simple if you have a permanent good. If, it's, if you have a 10-year life, it gets more complicated. But basically, um, for example, land is considered a permanent good. If you buy land, if it's still going to be in use forever, let's say, let's say you're buying land on 50, 50th Street and Broadway, uh, you're buying land forever. You're getting the use of it for all time, so to speak. If this, if the, if the returns weren't discounted, if the rents weren't discounted by the rate of interest. You'd never be able to buy that land because the land price would be infinite. In other words, you'd be getting, let's say, $100,000 a year, say, for valuable land forever. So you can never sum it up. You can never, land would be infinitely high in price. The fact that land is not infinitely high in price, which obviously isn't since people are pretty high here, but you still can buy it, it means that it's discounted by the rate of interest. So that the fact that you might get $100,000 from it 200 years from now doesn't mean a hell of a lot to you. It's almost negligible. So all these things are incorporated by being discounted into the into the interest return. So this is particularly this formula is particularly accurate with land because it's considered to have infinite life. It doesn't it's not limited. But this is a basic proportion. It demonstrates to you that the capital value of something is directly proportional to the average productivity or the rent rental return, and indirect inversely proportional to the rate of interest. You know, in other words, if the rate of interest is let's say it's ten percent, so every year. It's worth a, 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 a sum of 10,000 plus 9,000 plus 8,100, et cetera, et cetera, to, to yield a final lump sum that's worth right now in the market. Well, if the rate of interest goes up to 20%, and it's obviously then going to be worth only 10,000 plus 8,000 plus uh, whatever, 6,400, et cetera. It's going to be worth a lot less. Uh, if, if the interest rate goes down, say 5%, then it's worth 9,500, et cetera. It's going to be worth a lot more as, as you sum it up. In other words, every piece of capital equipment, every piece of capital, I means land, slaves under slavery, and, and, and machines, will be worth more if the, if the rent goes up, the annual productivity or rent, and worth less if the interest rate goes up. Inversely proportional to the interest rate, directly proportional to the, to the annual rent. <coughs> um, and uh, this is why, by the way, the, the, uh, the stock market has acted a rather peculiar way for many years. The stock market, we've been the papers have been talking a lot recently about the stock market boom. The boom is only relative. In other words, the boom is relative to what it was a year ago. But basically, uh, the, the stock average, the, the so-called Dow Jones average is the most uh, famous one, where you take the 30 top stock, leading stocks, and then um, put them, average them into an index, and you get a, a, an absolute number. Uh, which doesn't mean anything itself. It just means it's relative to each other. The other numbers, as you go down the, the years, you know, since 1920, whenever they first started the Dow Jones Index. Um, 1966, the average Dow Jones 
stock was a thousand. In other words, a thousand was the, was the number averaging all the various stock values. Uh, in 19, uh, last year, let's say 1985, it was still down about 1,200. As a matter of fact, it hadn't gone above a thousand for a long time. So this means that in 20 years, let's say, the, uh, the average stock is only going up by 20% as an average uh, number. On the other hand, prices, the price level has tripled since 1956. So the, um, this is a thousand, this is the price level, a consumer's price index. It's 3,000 now. So this is, this means that the average stock value has been wiped out. In other words, the average person who held blue chip stocks or an average, let's say, of Dow Jones stocks, which usually the top stocks, most of the best companies, the biggest companies and all that. Uh, if they just held on to it, they've essentially been semi-wiped out. In other words, they've not, only, not only have they not been keeping pace with the price index, it's, it's way below it. <coughs> so your the capital value is going down almost by two thirds uh, uh, since 1966. It's now up to about 1,800. So it's, there's been a big boom, 1,700 something, in last year. But it's still not that great if you consider it should be 3,000 if you're really going to match what it, well, stocks were, stock prices were in 1966. So the thing that's just kept a damper on the stock market for a long time now, even though there's been a lot of prosperity, but even though profits have gone up, in other words, the rental value of the, of the capital equipment of these corporations have gone up, interest rates have also gone up, at least until a couple of years ago. So as interest rates go up, this puts a permanent damper on stocks. Because even though the profits are going up, so that the value of a, of a corporation's assets go up, uh, interest rates have also gone up with inflation, as, in, as, as we see in macroeconomics. As you inflate, as people catch on what's happening, the interest rates are add on to the interest return because creditors get wiped out in inflation. So you add on a return, and this puts an almost permanent damper on the stock market. Uh, stocks are a what stocks are. Uh, they're essentially the people's evaluation of a corporate asset, the assets of each corporation. Every corporation got a certain amount of assets, expected returns on the assets, hopeful profits current profits and hopeful future profits. And these get incorporated into the valuation of the assets that the market puts on them. Uh, this is uh, capital equipment, buildings, goodwill, and all that sort of stuff, which incorporate into the products of, and the profits and the, and the products of the corporation. So uh, if, the, uh, if the profits or expected profits go, go up, expected future profits go up, stock prices will go up, so expected return. But if interest rates go up, Again, this means that the, this, this puts a, a damper. This, this tends for the price of the stock to go down. Um, so um, this is basically what, what reason why stocks are not a good inflation hedge. And most people think, boy, why, why, why not? A hedge against inflation, if you expect future inflation, you buy a lot of stock. But the problem with that is even though profits go up, interest rates also go up. And this, this, this tends to put a ceiling on stock prices. Uh, same way with the bond market. In the bond market, <coughs> Uh, which is, by the way, bigger than the stock market by far, and, and, and overall numbers. Uh, what you have with bonds, either government bonds or corporate bonds, a corporation, let's say, issues a bond saying, um, we will pay, let's say it's a $1,000 bond. Okay, so this means the bond is $1,000, and it's due in 25 years, let's say. In 25 years, they'll pay off the whole $1,000. In the meantime, <clears throat> it's a... Uh, they'll pay, let's say, 10%. Let's say 10% is an easy figure. 10% par interest. So in other words, this corporation, General Motors or whatever, is committed to paying every year on a certain date, let's say December 1st or whatever, 100 bucks. It's a coupon. You get coupons at the bottom of the bond. And every year you take the coupon, there's 25 coupons, let's say, for a 25-year bond. Every year you take, you clip the, you clip the, you tear it off and send it to the corporation headquarters and they send you 100 bucks. So in other words, what a bond gives you is a right to $100 a year okay, over a 25-year period. It's a claim or a right to 100 bucks a year. So the par interest isn't that important. The important thing is you have a, what you have is a right to $100 a year. By the way, that's why bondholders are often called coupon clippers, because they, they, they make their money by taking the coupon, clipping, you know, clipping, up, clipping off an edge of it, and sending it in. Now the question is how much is it, so this is a new bond when it comes on the market, it has a certain par interest rate. But the, the bonds are traded all the time back and forth. There was a huge bond market, corporate and government bonds, and people buying and selling them, old bonds all the time. 
And how much they buy or sell for depends on the supply and demand of the market. And basically, it depends on what the interest rate is, the general interest rate. Because um, if, uh, if the general interest rate is, let's say, 10%, they'll be selling at 100. But supposing the interest rate goes up to 20%, which it was in about the early 70s for a while, a couple of years. At a 20% interest rate, um, nobody's going to spend 1000 bucks. In other words, uh, they're asking you here, when the bond was first issued, you pay $1,000 and you get 10% for the right to get $100 a year. Uh, this is a 10% per year return. Nobody's going to do that if they can get 20% other places, uh, money market funds or whatever. So this means in order to, to make this attractive, uh, to make the selling of old bonds attractive, the bond price falls from $1,000, which is the was issued at, to about $500. At, at $500, you only have to, to buy a, the right to $100 a year because then you're getting a 20% return. In other words, the 20% interest is the yield, what's known as the yield on the bond market. This is what the bond yields from moment to moment as you, as you buy it on the market. So this is the interest yield. Even though the par interest rate is 10%, that was five years ago, 10 years ago, nobody cares about that. In effect, what happens is, in order to get a claim on $100 a year, you're willing to, to buy it, to pay for it, only $500. Because you want a 20% return, because that's what you can get other places. This, this way, interest rates tend to equalize throughout the time market. Not instantaneously, but the tendency is to, is to equalize. If you can get 20% somewhere else, you're not going to pay 20% uh, on the bond market. You're not going to get, yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to get, buy bonds for 10% if you can get 20% or 18% or whatever in the money market fund. So, um, conversely, if the price, if the interest rates go down, let's say to 5%, to make it again simple arithmetic here, um, in other words, here we have in our formula. If the interest rates go down, the capital value goes down. In this case, if interest rates go up to 20%, the capital value went down to 500. Um, the rental return is the same all the time. It's a fixed in a bond. It's fixed at $100 a year forever. because That's the way it was issued. Um, if uh, the interest rate goes down to 5%, however, this means now people are willing to pay more for, for $100 a year. And so the bond prices bid up to, uh, to $2,000. At $2,000, then, you pay 100 If you pay $2,000 to get $100 a year, you're paying 5%. In other words, and the, as the interest rate falls, in this case of 5%, the capital value is up to $2,000. So in other words, the bond, the bond yield, interest yield on, the bond, on bonds is exactly inverse proportion to the interest rate. I mean, excuse me, to the, to the, to the, to the price of the bond. If the, if the bond price increases, it means the interest return has fallen. If the bond price goes down, it means the interest return goes up. So this is why during an inflation, during the later stages of inflation, when people catch on to what's going on, namely this constant inflation, uh, interest rates keep going up because, uh, because the value of the dollar is worth less when you pay, it, pay back the debt than when you get it. In other words, if, if you pay, if you charge 10% interest on a, on a loan, and two years from now you get the loan back, but now the dollar is only worth half of what it was before, it means you're getting virtually wiped out. You're getting only 5%. Uh, so, as the creditors and debtors begin to wake up to the permanent inflation that has existed in the 70s, the interest rate, as inflation premium gets tacked on, on the interest rate. As the interest rate goes up, the bond prices fall. Uh, the interest yield goes up. Bond prices start collapsing during it. So if you have a really severe inflation, the bond price, the bond market collapses, as it did in Britain and any other country with, with hyperinflation. The first thing that collapses is the bond market. Nobody's going to buy. Nobody's going to buy the right to hundred dollars a year, a thousand dollars a year. They know that hundred or thousand would be worth peanuts in, in a year and a half or something. So, so um, when inflation was moderated, has not gone eliminated, but it was moderated by the Reagan administration, uh, down to lower, much lower levels. The bond market has revived. Before that, the bond market was a point of you know, it's cracking all together. <clears throat> um, in Britain, when the Britain had a severe inflation, which is still more or less still going on to some extent, the bond market is the first thing to collapse. Nobody would buy bonds. Nobody would invest in it. So if you think there's going to be inflation, if you're, if you're anticipating higher inflation, don't buy bonds of any sort. It's the first thing not to get, unless you're willing to hold on to it for until it matures, of course, which is you know, 20 or 25 years. So if you're expecting to try to get rid of it someday, sell it, uh, it's, the worst thing to, it's the worst thing to buy. The first, thing, the first people who wiped out in the United States inflation were the guys who bought savings bonds. At, those days, like 3% or something. 
you hold on to a savings bond for 20, 25 years, and you get, you find out the money you get is worth about half of it was when you first invested in it because of, because of inflation. So it's the last thing to get. <coughs> um, the, uh, okay, see, now we see that the interest rate, or the term is especially the interest rate is a, is a time market and time preferences, and plus, plus or minus inflation premium. It's like a really a macro question. But anyway, that's the basic, uh, basic cause of it. And I'd say the time market permeates both for, uh, for rental, a relationship between rent and capital value for interest rates in general. So what you're doing is uh, the, the capital value of anything, whether it's a bond or stocks or a house or um, a machine or, or factories or whatever, is determined by the discounted sum of future, expected future rent or expected future returns on the whatever, whatever the product is. Uh, and so the, the capital value is determined by two things, the, the expected rents, the future, expected future rents or returns from the, uh, from the product, and the interest rate, <coughs> which, uh, the discount rate which you use to apply to it. Um, and this is again why when interest rates go up, future investments become less profitable. And investment in long-term future construction projects, things like that, become much less profitable. When, invest when interest rates go down, they become much more profitable. Uh, when, uh, when the government's trying to evaluate, for example, whether or not a certain future dam or any other long-range project is, pro is pro profitable or not, it much, much depends on what interest rate they, they consider the, the correct interest rate to charge. The government always likes to charge, give itself a low interest rate to make, make whatever it does seem profitable. If you take the market interest rate, most of the government projects are, are, are uneconomic, to begin, even, even on, on their face. Because the returns might be 4% and the interest rate is 10% or something like that. It's obviously uneconomic, even without any other deeper consideration. So, uh, so we then have a uh, relationship between capital value now. We, we determine what the capital value of everything is, or the price of every, the whole product. Namely, the, disc, the sum of future rents or expected future rents discounted by the interest rate. Interest rate is determined by the time market, uh, plus inflation premiums when there's inflation. <coughs> Uh, time preferences. Time preferences can change in accordance with lots of lots of things. Uh, cultural uh, cultural points. Uh, risk of risk of uh, being confiscated. Obviously, if you're if you're thinking of, if your investments can be confiscated, you're not going to invest very much. You might spend more uh, currently, figuring what the heck uh, tomorrow we will be, you know, the money's going to be confiscated anyway. You may as well spend it now. Things of that sort. Um, usually, as 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 a, usually as the economy gets more affluent, people have a lower and lower time preference rates, usually. They're willing then to invest more in the future and, and consume less now because they're more affluent now. So usually, as a long-run proposition, interest rates will fall over time. But this is not necessarily true. It's just a, a general tendency. And also, interest rates differ. Time preference differ over cultures. Some cultures, people are much more thrifty, save a lot for the future. They have a low time preference. Others, other cultures are going to spend money right, right now, and they have a high time preference rate. So... Uh, and over the market, of course, all these things balance down into a general overall interest rate. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, we've now really mopped up, we've now concluded the analysis of the market and market pricing. We've now got consumer goods prices, uh, producers' goods prices, wage rates, uh, rental prices of all sorts, and finally the relationship between that and the interest rate and, uh, and capital value, capital goods, capital values in general. It's called capitalization, by the way. It's this process of arriving at the capital price is called capitalization. Capitalization of future rents. Uh, and now we can finally conclude uh, our analysis of things like taxi medallions. Remember, we talked about taxi medallions, tobacco right, rights to grow tobacco, and things of that sort. Uh, of course, they're determined by supply and demand. But also, in addition to that, supply and demand basically is the value of, the, of this monopoly privilege, the, the taxi medallion, will be, the capital value, will be determined by the sum of future rents, okay, uh, this kind of by interest rate. So uh, as, as the profits on the taxi business go up, the, the capital value of the medallion tends to go up. On the other hand, if interest rates go up, it tends to lower the capital value. One of the reasons why the medallion was about 80, 60,000, I think, when Miller wrote his book, it's now about 105,000. One of the reasons for that is the drop in interest rates in the last four or five years. They've dropped from about 12% to about 8 or something like that. I mean, depending on what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it's divided. Yeah. Why am I better? I don't know looking at it. So, um, 
<laughs> yeah. It's uh, basically, I mean, you're, you're, you're multiplying by, by a percentage you're dividing by. It. So, um, at any rate, the uh, so as the interest rates have fallen the last few years, as the because inflation has has fallen, uh, the value of, of capital assets like that, uh, in that case, the right to, to, to operate to run a cab or drive a cab, uh, own a cab, I should say, is uh, going way up. <clears throat> So uh, it's been a reflection of, so in other words, what these medallions are, they're rights, they're rights to monopoly privilege or monopoly rights to this, uh, to this restricted entry into a restricted profession of operating a cab. Um, and the same way with tobacco rights, and rights to tobacco growing plantations, oil import rights at the time we had oil import quotas, uh, only certain people can, those who own the right to have a tobacco farm, those who own the right to import oil, these fluctuate in accordance with supply and demand and need, but the supply and demand depends on people's estimates of future rents, of future returns, and the rate of interest, and weighing the two against each other. So, um, and uh, I guess that that really completes our discussion of the market. The next hour, we'll talk about the we'll sum up the course and have questions and whatever. And talk, talk a little bit about the exam. Ten minute break. Oh, it's going to be uh, an all objective answer. In other words. Multiple, as I said last time, multiple choice, some multiple choice in the, in the good old manner you're now accustomed to. Some fill in the blanks, and some fill in the blanks with multiple choice, which is really the same thing as multiple, another form of multiple choice. Uh, so I'm, the purpose of this review is to, is to help you out here. And then, so we, if you want to start asking questions any time, just break in, because that's the whole point. Whatever is fuzzy to be clarified. Um, the, uh, we started with the law of diminishing margin utility for the basic uh, form of action, analysis of action, um, applying to anything, uh, any consumer good in particular. If um, for any, the supply of any good increases, uh, uh, the value attached to any one unit will decline. And uh, because your, your most important use comes first, then your next important use, et cetera, et cetera. So the greater the supply of a product, the um, Lower the value of each unit of the, of the product. This, this solves the so-called paradox of value or value paradox, or the diamond, the diamond bread or diamond water paradox. Namely, how come uh, bread, which is very important, or water, which is very important, a staff of life, how come they're worth very little on the market? Their prices are very cheap. On the other hand, diamonds, which are mere frippery and luxury, are very expensive. So this seems to be a contradiction between use value and, and exchange value, or, or uh, prices. And uh, the law of diminishing margin utility clears that up, namely that uh, in real life we choose and buy stuff or, or not buy stuff, not on the basis of the philosophic value of the whole, of the class of goods, but on the basis of each unit, we buy units. We buy loaves of bread or TV sets or, or diamond car carrots or diamond or whatever, and we buy them in relation to the supply that's available. So that because bread and water have a huge supply, huge stock available, the value of each unit is low, whereas diamonds are quite rare and therefore, and, and limit very small in supply, and therefore the value of each unit is, is higher. <clears throat> so this clears up the alleged paradox or conflict between use value and exchange value. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> from the law of diminishing margin utility, we get the, we arrive at the falling demand curve, our basic, uh, basic curve macroeconomics. The prices on the y-axis and the quantities on the x-axis, we get a demand curve falling. In other words, the higher the price, the less will be purchased, either for each individual or even more for the market as a whole. <clears throat> so this gives you, in other words, the locus of how many product, how many of the units will be purchased given the different prices. <clears throat> and the intersection of the demand curve and any existing supply, supply line will give the market price and uh, we saw why this is true, because if the price is higher than the market price, <coughs> you get a surplus, an unsold surplus, means the supply is greater than, than the demand at that price. And the unsold surplus, in order to sell the surplus, businessmen who want to increase their profits and de decrease their losses will cut the price, and if they do that, the surplus is eliminated. Uh, similarly, if the price is below the market price, there's a X, more people want to buy it than there is available. Demand is greater than supply at that. There's a, there's a shortage, and uh, the stuff disappears from the shelf very quickly. And, and then, in response to that, businessmen raise their prices and see that their 
They may, they may as well charge more since the stuff is disappearing quickly, and as they do that, the shortage is eliminated. And so we're back again to the equilibrium point. <clears throat> at the equilibrium point, and only at that point, is the supply and demand equal. <clears throat> the market is, in other words, cleared. There's, there's no shortage, there's no surplus, and the amount offered is exactly how much the people want to buy. So this is our fundamental analysis of, the, of market prices and the market in general, that the, it's responding to uh, demand curves, demand uh, values of consumers, which in turn determine the demand curve, which in turn uh, determine the price given whatever supply is available. And, um, and then if the demand increases, demand curve go, goes up for any reason, uh, price will go up, and then more supply will be brought forth, profits will go up, and therefore people will produce more of it over time. So that over time, the supply curve will keep increasing, say to here, you'll get a a larger, in response to the higher demand, you get eventually a larger, and the higher price, you get eventually a larger production. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> conversely, if the demand curve, demand curve falls for whatever reason, let's say the people shift their, their taste from bourbon to vodka, the demand curve for vodka goes up, the demand curve for bourbon goes down. As that happens, the price falls, and losses are made, are incurred, and business spends supply less bourbon over time, and the supply goes down, and the price goes up a bit. So you, what you have then, in other words, is in response to the long-term change in demand, in this case a fall, less, less bourbon is produced 10 years from now, let's say, than it would be now, because of this long-term shift. So in other words, resources are determined over time on the basis of land, labor, and capital, how much is being produced, is re and responding to consumer demand, and how much they're willing to pay for the different products. Uh, so at any given time, the market price is determined by the intersection of supply and demand, and in the long run, uh, supply is, is, uh, is influenced or determined by long run demand. <clears throat> uh, then we uh, went through the various applications of this and why prices change, and then what happens if there's a <clears throat> price control by government which messes things up. In other words, a maximum price control creates a permanent shortage, which gets worse over time, it doesn't allow the market to to clear the market, creates a permanent shortage and lowers supply over time, which makes the shortage even worse, and various other effects, like markets and all these rationing through, lining up, queuing up, and all that sort of stuff. Decline in quality, all these things are a product of price and maximum, maximum price control. And uh, <clears throat> with minimum price control, where the government keeps up, keeps the price above the free market level, uh, and then the supply is greater than the demand permanently. In other words, the permanent surplus, which increases over time as the people will produce more of it at the higher, the greater profit. So you have a problem of a surplus which gets worse. This is particularly true in two areas historically. Uh, farm price supports, which of course are getting worse all the time, and minimum wage laws, similarly, which create unemployment or, or surplus labor looking for, for jobs that are not available. Um, and so uh, we saw how the farm price support from one intervention leads to more interventions to try to solve the... In other words, one intervention trying to cure a problem doesn't cure it. It creates problems which cause more interventions. And, and, and you know, as the supply, as the surpluses go up, then they try to make the farmers cut their production. So if they do it by making them cut their acreage, the farmers will cut the acreage and then produce more on each acre. So you wind up with even more, more uh, surplus. And you try to force them to cut the production. It's an endless chain of events brought about by the initial bad premise and then continuing on the same path. Uh, so uh, we went through a lot of that, how, what the effects of maximum price control and minimum price control are. This is minimum price control. Uh, that was about the first half of the term dealing with that. Then we went on to the uh, theory of the firm. And uh, the firm, of course, tries to maximize its profits and what exactly that meant. And so then we had, uh, this is the dollars on the y-axis, quantity of production on the x-axis. Then uh, total revenue, which is equal to price times quantity, and total cost, which is uh, amount purchased, uh, amount spent. And then total revenue, something like this. And uh, it can either go up or go down since price and quantity are uh, move uh, 
inversely. In other words, as the price goes up, quantity so will go down, and vice versa. As we saw from the demand curve, total cost is always rising. This is a minimum total cost, providing that firms have the incentive to keep the total cost at the minimum, but you don't have cost plus pricing and defense contracts and all that, where the cost will balloon upward because the government's, the taxpayer is paying them back, uh, recompensing them plus a guaranteed rate of profit, guaranteed markup. So in this case, the uh, maximum profit will be the maximum distance between the two, say here, be the production point. And this will tend to be the, also be the, the slope of the tangents are equal, or the marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. <coughs> marginal being the, the uh, change in rev total revenue divided by delta Q, and marginal cost being a change in total cost for each new unit. <coughs> um, so this is, but marginal revenue, marginal, uh, equaling marginal cost is a necessary but not sufficient condition of maximizing total profit, because it could be in a minimum zone here too. In other words, the two things are, the tangents are also equal to a minimum. And the only way you can tell whether the maximum minimum is to look at the total. Unless, as the textbooks do, you implicitly assume only one peak. In other words, if you assume it only, if you cut the thing off here, then of course it's easy. Then you say, well, whenever the ma marginals are equal, then it's maximum profit. That's, that's because you're they're for, conveniently forgetting about the other possible troughs and peaks uh, in, the, in the, the production schedule. Uh, okay, this is an area. So in other words, the maximum profit point will be at a, whatever, wherever it is, it will be at a point where the demand curve for the firm is elastic. This is the elastic zone. Demand curve for the firm. It'll never be an inelastic zone. So it means any 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 business firm, regardless of the size or whatever. We'll always be producing, if it knows what's going on, if it has any smarts at all, we'll always be producing an area where the demand for its product is elastic. Um, okay, tr transposing that into the, the other diagram for this is the average and marginal diagrams. This is the total diagram. This is a total revenue and total curve. If we assume only one peak and no trough, okay, if we cut this off here, as the textbooks always do to make life easier for them, then uh, and we have uh, total revenue will be, since the demand curve is always falling, that's the same thing as the average revenue curve. Marginal revenue will always be falling below it, uh, and it's falling more sharply. It's mathematically the way it always works out. This is marginal revenue. The cost curve, as we've seen, is more or less U-shaped, uh, although not not precisely that. Anyway, if it's U shaped, something like that, it decreases the average total cost, decreases over time, over uh, product number produced until it reaches some kind of trough and then goes up again. So marginal cost is something like this, will intersect at the cost point with our usual mar marginal average relationship. <clears throat> Namely, whenever an average of anything is falling, the marginal is below it. Whenever the average of anything is rising, the marginal is above it, and therefore whenever the average of anything is at a trough or a peak, it inter intersects the marginal. And so uh, the maximum profit point then, given all the assumptions, given there's only one peak and no, and no trough point, will be wherever these two intersect, the marginal revenue and marginal cost intersect. In other words, if you only have this diagram, you don't have that one. <clears throat> so this will be here. And then the total profits will then be, at that point, Let's say this is a, a thousand units or whatever you're producing. At that thousand units, uh, this is average revenue and this is average cost. So the total profit is equal to average revenue minus average cost times quantity. And this, in other words, this, this follows from that. Uh, profits equal total revenue minus total cost. So profits are also equal to total revenue divided by quantity, which is average cost average revenue, minus total revenue divided by quantity, which is average cost, times quantity. Like this, these drop out. So in other words, total profits will be this area here, this minus that, times that. This will be the total profits. At, that, at the maximum profit point, at the, where production is a thousand, let's say, the maximum profit point. Um, 
Average costs are are um, falling, are U-shaped because they're indivisible, even though the production function is such as you might think that it should be a constant average cost because av same causes always yield the same effect. Uh, the average cost curve is falling over for, for a long time because, or for a short time, whatever, because uh, of indivisibility. The fact that factors of production cannot be multiplied, cannot all be multiplied to the same extent. So since you can't, you can multiply the, well, just for a while, I'll so stop yelling in there, up there. Uh, since you, uh, since you can't, you can multiply the number of shipments, freight car shipments by 20% or whatever, but you can't multiply the number of tracks by 20%. You can only either double them or leave them the same amount. So you have these indivisibilities, and therefore, as you keep increasing the production, you tap the, use up more of the fixed cost, more of these big indivisible factors of production. And I finally get to the point where all are being used up in the beginning to be overused until the average costs start going up. Um, in real life, the uh, average cost cur curve usually goes, instead of going to a fixed one point or one trough point, it usually goes down like that, reaches a plateau, and it goes up again. Uh, so there's a whole area here the zone in which business men are interested in, where average cost is constant, marginal cost is the same as average cost, and it goes up for that length of time. Which is why business men don't understand what economists are talking about. Economists are talking about average and marginal. To them, the business men, costs are always constant. And the reason is that they're dealing in this zone. They're not interested in a hypothetical zone when, when they're never actually functioning. Um, <clears throat> And then we went on to uh, pricing of factors of production, and uh, we're going through a long, elaborate process of showing how factors of production are, are, are the demand curve for factors of production is determined. Turns out the demand curve will be the marginal revenue product curve, which will be falling for two reasons. One, because marginal physical product is falling. And two, because the demand curve is falling. In other words, marginal revenue is falling. So that when you multiply marginal physical product times marginal revenue, you get a falling marginal revenue product. Yes, sir? Beg your pardon? Yeah, this is the demand curve for the this is the demand curve for the firm for the product of the firm. Demand curve for Wonder Bread. This is the demand curve of the firm for factors of production: wages, labor, land, and capital. This is the demand curve for the factor. Okay, and this is the demand curve for the product, product of the firm. So this is the demand curve for the factors of production, and then the supply of factors of production is whatever it is, whatever the stock of labor, land, and capital is. And that will give them the uh, yield, the wage rate, or the price of the factors, or whatever, the intersection of these two things. And uh, the supply of labor, particularly, of course, largely determined by population. We went into that last time about the, the, uh, the alleged population problem, which turns out really not to be much of a problem. It's really the population follows the you know, income level, more or less, over, over, over time. As, as uh, income and wage rates go up, and real wage rates go up, standard living goes up, population usually tends to adjust itself to that. So it's to maintain a, uh, a desired income level. <clears throat> Uh, contrast the Malthusian doctrine, which is that people always breed up to the subs down to the subsistence level, so to speak. And today, of course, we talk about interest rate and the capitalization and the, how capitalization is determined by the expected future returns or rents from a product or equipment or whatever. Uh, and the, the intersect interaction between that and the interest rate, rate which is the time preference rate. Okay, are there any questions on any, any of this stuff? We have a whole, I've summarized the whole term now in about a half hour, so. Is there any, uh, yeah? Final will be, as I said, the uh, multiple choice and fill in the blanks. Most of the blanks, of, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, no, we'll cover the whole term, but we'll cover the major stuff. There's not, there'll be no trick questions about obscure areas. I mean, basically, it's the, we'll cover these major things we've been talking about. Um, yeah. 
The final will be whatever, in other words, if, if I'm leaning over backward to help the students. If the, if the final, is, if you do better on the final than on the midterm, I figure you've increased in stature, you've learned, etc. so it'd be worth more than 50%. If on the other hand you do worse than the final, I'll give it 50%. So I'll, I'll try my best to, so it's not, it's not mechanistic. Uh, and so, um, who else? So there'll be, fill, there'll be multiple choice. There'll also be fill in the blanks, which is multiple choice, where you really, you know, you have a blank, it's either increase, decrease, remains the same or indeterminate. And there's a fill in, a real fill in the blank, you put your own word in. However, you don't, don't worry about the grammar. The key thing is to forget about the grammar. Just don't worry about the sentence structure and whether plural or, or singular or anything like that. Just put in what you think is right. And, uh, this is not an English course. <laughs> you have to worry about that. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, I should mention the union stuff will be covered as far as, you know, the impact of unions on the, um, wage rate. Craft union versus industrial union. The Wagner Act is uh, changing the whole labor market structure. Yeah. Well, well, the, the Wagner Act is 1935. It's like you know that. That's about it. The Wagner Act came in 1935, and uh, that's no, no, that's that's the only that's the only date you have to know. 1935 is the Wagner Act. <laughs> okay. That's uh. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, once again, the, uh, there'll be nothing, you should read this, the chapters that they're indicated in the, in the outline, but there's nothing, there won't be anything on the exam that I haven't talked about in class. There's a lot of stuff, which of course the book has that I don't talk about, and that's, that's not, not being included. That's it? Anything else? Okay, God bless you. Good luck. 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 Anything else? Okay, God bless you. Good luck.